Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's an honor to be with you all on this beautiful Mother's Day. So I heard this interesting fact recently about flamingos, that they will actually lose their pink color and turn more gray while they raise their young. <laughs> and the reason that this happens is because of all the energy that they're put in, putting into caring for their babies. When I was looking into this, verifying this fact, I also discovered that flamingos can show us some valuable lessons about parenthood and what a fitting day it is to share this with you. So whoever coined the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, could very well have been observing flamingos. For this species, it takes the entire colony, or as I most recently learned, a group of flamingos is called a flamboyance, fun fact, <laughs> to raise their young. They'll plan to have all their babies in the same season and at the same time, building their nests close to their friends, making a neighborhood of nests. All the adult flamingos will take care of the babies, leaving mainly the feeding to the parents alone. The parents who actually mate for life. Sorry, I lost my spot. <laughs> The parents who mate for life are both involved in the egg and chick care, and they share the entire load, which I think is a great thing to, to do. <laughs> Some may know this, but the reason flamingo feathers are pink is not because they're born that way. It's because their diet is loaded with beta carotene, which is the same organic compound found in foods that we eat, like carrots or sweet potatoes. Baby flamingos will turn pink only once they no longer require mom and dad to help them eat and become more self-sufficient. Similarly, the adult flamingos will return to their normal pink colors after the trying period of feeding their young is done. As a young mom, I can relate to these birds. I think that all parents can relate to these birds, but not even just parents. Anyone that's ever put energy into anything can relate to growing weary, to losing your color, your shine, or your joy. Even in doing one of the most life-giving things I've ever done, raising my four beautiful babies, I can and I have lost my color. I can grow numb to the beauty of what I'm called to do. And in this day and age, walking out a life of faith, of believing in Jesus, it can and it will get tiring. And I believe that the Lord has put a word on my heart for us all today. And he wants to remind us of the joy and the rest that we will find in him alone. Not in the doing, not in the striving. He wants to be our source. So before I begin, before we open the word, I want to um, really take a moment to prepare our hearts to receive from him and what he wishes to speak to you all today. So let's pray. Lord, we invite you to come. We invite you to come and refresh us, Lord. And if there's places in our lives where we've grown weary, where we're tired, I pray that we would be aware of that. Lord, that we would be aware so that we can lay it at your feet, Jesus. Lord, we want to walk in alignment with your word and believe in you fully because you say that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And we want to learn how to rest in you even in the midst of trial and temptations. I pray that you would teach us today instead of striving in our own strength, to follow you, our good shepherd, and our kind shepherd. So if you're paying any attention to the scripture reading today, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but there's this beautiful thread woven throughout about Jesus as our good shepherd. So I want to turn to our gospel first in John 10, starting at verse 22. It says... At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. 
It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So to get a full picture of what's going on, uh, the Feast of Dedication is what we would know today as Hanukkah. So it's winter, probably not like Rochester winter, but Jesus, maybe he walked in the temple because, you know, it's cold, it's winter. All right, picking up in verse 24. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. So let's step back and look at this. It's kind of humorous, honestly, because they're saying, will you tell us plainly? And Jesus says, I told you, and you don't believe me. And also, he sees and knows what's in their hearts. They think that they have it all together. They're the religious leaders. They have all the answers, and they don't need this quote-unquote Messiah who's come to stir up their entire livelihood. These people are so hard-hearted that they don't believe that They've seen all these amazing miracles Jesus has performed, and they don't believe him. Jesus is telling them that he's the Christ by his actions and his words, and he's doing what they asked. He's telling them plainly. So continuing in verse 26. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So our gospel reading ended there, um, which is kind of a cliffhanger uh, when we think about what Jesus is saying to these people. He's equating himself with God. He says, I and the Father are one. Isn't this what they asked of him? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly, they said. But the difference is that God incarnate, our Messiah of the whole world, Jesus, our good shepherd, doesn't fit into their box of who the Messiah should be. They're caught up in their own agendas, their own religiosity, the rules and perceptions that Jesus literally becomes someone that threatens their livelihood to the point that they want to and will kill him. There's no winning with them. They can't be convinced. They can't be argued with. They can't be argued with even by God himself. After Jesus says that he's one with the Father, they accuse him of blasphemy and they try to stone him. We can learn a lesson from these people. We must first recognize our need for a shepherd. That's what salvation is. Every day, every single day, as believers in Jesus, we should wake up, hear his voice, and choose to follow him. Not in our own strength or perceptions of what needs to happen in the world. We can't save ourselves. No matter how hard we try, no matter what we attempt to fill ourselves with, this world will always fall short. We, I, will always fall short. Every single time. We'll wander away when we're depending on our own strength. And we must recognize our need for a savior, our good shepherd, to lead us each and every day. This is how we find renewal and rest for our souls. There's an intimate comfort and promise in Jesus' words as he says in both verses 28 and 29 that no one can snatch him, snatch us from his hands or the Father's hands because he and the Father are one. When we're submitted fully to him, what worries should we have? Why do we worry 
as that song says that we've sung here many times, God's not worried, why do we worry? There's a rest he has in store for us as his sheep. We are his sheep, and he is our shepherd. Have you ever thought about what it means to be a sheep? Like, <laughs> let's be honest. Being compared to sheep really is not flattering <laughs> because sheep are known as being stupid. They need someone to watch over them and care for them. And if they're not being watched, they become easy targets. They will easily wander away without a thought in their tiny little brains about what danger lies ahead or what could be lurking around the corner. The old lines of the hymn, Come Thou Fount, come to mind. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Can you relate? Are you prone to wander? Do you have need of a savior? Do you need a kind and generous shepherd who promises to always care for you? There's intimacy with God waiting for you in this surrender, in the recognition every single day that you need him. Have faith that he has provision in store and rest in store for you as you surrender and trust him fully. When we're compared in the Bible to sheep, I don't think that it's about our futility. What if he's just asking us to return to the simplicity of surrender, like that of a sheep that need guidance, or like a small child who's comforted by their parents? It's not something we have to think or ponder through. It makes me think of this scripture in Mark 10. Jesus says that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. The faith God is looking for, which by the way can only come from him, is humble, teachable, and trusting, like a child and like sheep. So then if we're supposed to be like sheep, what does it really mean for God to be our shepherd? We hear a lot about shepherds during Christmas time because they were the first ones told by an angel to go and worship the newborn king. It's often taught that shepherds were outcasts of some sort. Their time is completely devoted to their livestock. In Bible times, they were most likely uneducated, poor, and honestly, they might have smelled bad. They would have been the least expected people, the least expected to have the honor of witnessing the greatest miracle to ever occur in the history of the world, Jesus being born. But God's kingdom is not of this world. And he says that the last will be first and the first will be last. God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He's not always going to show up how we expect him to. But get to know him, and he will far exceed your expectations. David, the writer of Psalm 23, which we'll look at shortly, understood what he was saying when he wrote, The Lord is my shepherd. As the youngest of eight brothers, David was the baby of the family. This meant that he got the least amount of inheritance. He was overlooked at his young age. He was overlooked quite literally, as some may know, the story of the prophet Samuel seeking a king from one of Jesse's sons. Jesse presents seven other sons before Samuel. But David's left with the short end of the stick, the least desirable job of the family. He was the shepherd. Samuel has to ask Jesse if all these seven sons before him are all of his sons. Though they look like they could be kings, God says, don't look at appearance, because I look at the heart. God does the unexpected. He prods Samuel and asks if he missed a son. Sure enough, there's David over there tending the sheep the least expected person possible. This story 
in the Bible, I believe is a prophetic shadowing of who Jesus is when he enters the world. He's not what the Jews expected, as I said before. And he doesn't fit their ideology of what the Messiah will look like and what he will accomplish. So how is God our shepherd? I think that we see these characteristics, especially in the life and the witness of Jesus, who is our good shepherd, as we just read in John 10. God likes to show up how we least expect him. Sometimes he comes like a fire or like a flood. Then there's times where he's just the still small voice. He can and he will show up however he wants to. As his sheep, he promises that we will know his voice. So let's first recognize our need for him. When we surrender to his guidance and leading daily, he promises to faithfully lead us. He is a good shepherd who has rest in store for our souls. So during spring break a couple of weeks ago, I made it a point to take all of my kids out, all four of them, on some fun outings so that we wouldn't be stuck inside the whole week or else I would probably lose my mind a little bit, honestly. So some Tuesdays, I meet with a group of local moms and uh, usually while the older two are in school, I go out with just the twins for little play group, depending if we have the energy or not that morning. Um, And on these outings, I usually prepare myself that I will be exhausted by the end of it because, you know, two babies. (laughs) So this particular Tuesday, I packed up all four kids, and I remember it being around 9.30 in the morning, and I received a call from my mom as I was packing the kids into the car, and she was very surprised when she realized that we were outside. We were on FaceTime. She saw we were outside, and then she was more surprised when she figured out that I had gotten all these kids out of the door before 9.30 a.m., because, you know, it's a good feat. I had gotten all of them dressed, fed, shoes on, teeth brushed, hair comb, out the door. (sighs) If only I had time to reward myself with a nice coffee. (laughs) <laughs> but I was late for my playgroup, unfortunately. So it can be difficult for me to keep track of the twins in public places. I mean, I'm sure you can observe what goes on here. Uh, because they're one-year-olds and they're curious. And so we went to the Greece Library, which, if you haven't been to recently, has this newly renovated kids wing, uh, which is essentially like a free, strong museum of play. It's great. And there's this portion with stairs, which, of course, Rory noticed immediately because she has an obsession with stairs. This girl is determined to climb any stairs she can find. So I hold her off and try to distract her for as long as possible, and at probably my fifth or sixth attempt to pull her away from these stairs. I finally give in. I let her climb the stairs. There's all these older kids stomping past us, not paying attention to her. I'm afraid they're going to trample over her, but she's in her glory, that girl. She won, and she knows it. (laughs) And then off in the distance, I see Ainsley, the lower level, she's contentedly playing, and another of my mom friends is nearby, so I know that she will watch out for Ainsley as I'm paying attention to everyone else. (laughs) A couple minutes go by, and I see Ainsley in full view, but I notice that the look on her face changed. And it's like she looks like she wonders where her people went. Like she's just kind of staring off. She doesn't cry. She doesn't look upset. She just looks around with this sweet and innocent confusion. And I really wish that I could have captured this moment on video because I'm up at the top of the stairs and from a decent distance, 
I see her, and she notices me. <laughs> and as soon as she spotted me, the largest dimply smile shone across her face, and she came speed crawling toward me, giggling toward me. And when I say speed crawling, I mean enough for my friend who was watching her to get up because she's like, oh, I got to chase this baby now. <laughs> oh, Ainsley wasn't afraid that we'd gone away completely. She wasn't crying and she wasn't scared. She was just a little bit confused. Her actions when she saw me were almost as if she was saying, oh, there you are. I knew you didn't leave me. What if we can trust God like that? Not just the knowledge that we need to trust, but really in our hearts, knowing and acting, speedily crawling to the feet of Jesus with a smile on our face. There you are, God. I knew you didn't leave me. Let's turn to Psalm 23. And I'm going to take another drink of water. So I know most of us here <clears throat> may have heard this psalm before. Some may have it memorized. It's a very popular psalm in the Bible. But I want to challenge you. Let's look at it with new eyes. And let's enter into these words. This psalm has been instrumental in my personal walk with God as I've literally placed myself in them, in these words. And I believe this can begin your journey or renewal of growing in intimacy with Jesus today and in hearing his voice. I think that Jesus, hearing Jesus' voice can be so much simpler than we make it sometimes because it starts with the Bible. Open it up. It's God-breathed, and it's living and active. And Jesus' words are all over it. As we enter into this psalm, I believe that the Lord has a rest in store for us that will come when we walk out these words in faith. So Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now I want to read this again as I wrap things up here this morning. But this time, I will challenge you to close your eyes and while your eyes are closed, I want to read this over you today. Picture yourself here. Picture yourself in the pastures, in the valley, at the table. What does this mean to you in the light of things that you're walking through today? And what is Jesus speaking to your heart in these words? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen.